Well, good morning and welcome. It's lovely to be able to see you all here today. And you know, God is delighted that out of everything we could have done this morning, that we've chosen to take the time to come and worship. And that's actually the theme of the sermon today. Part of our everyday life as disciples is how we worship. So let's stand and let's start leaning into the Lord. You know, we can worship God in any place at any time and give thanks to him. But today, we together have chosen as the body of Christ to support one another and to give praise and thanks to the Lord. And as we give praise and thanks to the Lord, God is always faithful and he longs to meet with us. So just invite you, why don't you just open your hands as a sign of openness for all that God has for us this morning. And Lord, we come to you with all our thanks, with all our hopes and dreams, but with all the things that we carry in so many ways. And as we just recognize all that we have, we choose in these moments to turn our eyes to you. And as we recognize your lordship here in this place, may you meet with us. May you reveal more of the Father to us. May you help us to look upon Jesus. And may your Holy Spirit transform us as we worship, as we sing, as we listen, as we encounter this day. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. May you meet with us, whether online or here in person. May you fill our hearts and renew our souls in your name. Amen.
thank you that you are good to us. We thank you for the way you meet with us and encounter us. Thank you that we can celebrate with all the great things you give us. And as our children and young people go out to their groups now, may you bless them and enable them to learn even more of you. And the same for us as we remain here and encounter you afresh. In your name. Amen. So if the children and young people would like to be able to make their way to the back and find the people with the green lanyards and the signs, for everybody else, why don't you take this moment to say hello to somebody who's sitting near you, particularly if you don't know them. It's lovely to be able to see you as the last of the children make their way to their groups. So we've got, we've got a couple of notices. And uh, last week, I started to share about our events over the summer. And I said we might get one. Well, at least it's sunny today. So we've got a chance uh, coming up. Over the summer, we have a number of different events. One of the first ones is CC Summertime. We're going to be having a hog roast out the back and some music out here as well. It's part of our outreach, so we'd love it if you wanted to come. Please bring a friend. There will be a short talk about Jesus and an opportunity to be able to respond. But it's going to be a fun evening from 6 to 8. We're getting in an inflatable as well. So if you wanted a bit of fun on an inflatable. And for once, that's going to be allowed for adults, unlike normal normally here, so you're welcome to just to come and have fun that evening, join in, but bring a friend and have that opportunity of helping people to connect with the church, but above all, to start to connect with Jesus. We've also got some other activities over the summer. You'll see on the 14th of July, uh, that's the CC Summertime. The 4th of August, we've got a picnic. We've got whole church rounders on the 14th. And on the 18th, we've got an ice cream sundae as well. So please do continue to see different activities during the summer. And also, during the summer, we have different parts where we might need some help for summer blasts with our children and young people during the week as well. All those details are on our church notice sheet. And you'll be getting that if you signed up to Church Suite. So if you haven't as yet signed up to Church Suite, just check your details. You should have had an email already, um, but please do just check your details so you can have all the information as well as following us on social media as well. Also, to let you know, next Saturday we have Oasis, which is our single parents ministry. And uh, Dave and Sue are going to be finishing doing that in its current form at this time. And so we've got other opportunities to support our single parents. But as it's the last one in the current form, we'd love some new leaders to come forward. But I would love us to give Dave and Sue a huge Christchurch thank you. You know, there is something absolutely amazing when we care for all the people amongst us. And Dave and Sue have gone above and beyond for caring for so many of our single parents over the year, even taking them camping with us to New Wine and helping them to know Jesus. We just wanted to thank you both so much for your amazing ministry here amongst us, and thank you for all your support. And so if you'd like to know more about how we can continue to support our single parents, please do see me, see Dave and Sue. But Dave and Sue, let's just give them one other huge round of applause. So thank you for them and all the team. 
You know, behind everything we do here at Christchurch are faithful people serving. And it's you guys praying and being a part of things. And so Jeff is now going to come up and lead our prayers. Here, Jeff, let me give you a hand. There you go, the step back. And here you stand. There you go. Here you go, Max. Yeah. Thank you, John. So let's pray. Oh, that's good. Oh, I feel like, oh, I feel like Taylor Swift now. <laughs> Oh, you don't want to hear me sing. I'm not sure what to say now. <laughs> Let's just close our eyes to pray. <laughs> okay, right. So, Lord, your promise is yes and again. So we come to you confident in prayer, praying for others. It's what you ask us to do. It's what you demand of us. So, loving Father, as John has said, we thank you for all the opportunities we have to reach out to the community around us. We w pray for the work with single parent families, making a huge difference to people whose lives are so difficult, often through no fault of their own. We pray for the mums and some dads, and especially for the children, that we may play a part in providing safe, comfortable, happy upbringing for those children. We pray for our own children and the children around us in the community, and especially for Christchurch School. We pray that as our new head comes along, that, that the new stage, the new st moving forward for Christchurch School may be fulfilling for the children there, that this may be a beacon of light to the community around us. Pray that you'll provide the people to be governors, teachers, helpers there at that school. We pray for our other activities that we just heard about from John, reaching out to the community, for the food bank, for Christians Against Poverty and the amazing work that does for people around us who are in need, often again through no fault of their own. We pray for all the other quiet work that's done among neighbours and friends to help in this community. And we pray that we may join in with others who are caring in the community, that we might see a stronger, stronger work here in where and in the surrounding area. So your promise is yes and again. So we pray that this might be blessed and might be fruitful. We pray for those that have gone out from us to share the word of God in local communities and across the world that we read about in our Where in the World newsletter. And this week we pray particularly for James and Mel Lynch, who are with us when they're studying at All Nations and now live and work in Birmingham. James helping churches to respond as we are to, the, to people in need in their communities in Sandwell. Mel working to help survivors of modern slavery and to... Uh, have more community cohesion and understanding across the area they live in and working with other Christians there. So as they have sacrificed comfort and prosperity to live on a low salary in a difficult area, pray that we will stand with them, pray for them and support them financially in other ways. These are people who have gone out from us, but they're still part of us. So Lord, we pray for them. In Jesus' name. And we open up our, our eyes and look around at the world. And we see so much need, so much war, so much injustice. And we see so many elections, so many important changes in government going on. In particular in the United States and here in the UK. So we earnestly pray, Sovereign Lord, loving Father, that you might raise up men and women of faith, of integrity, who will serve, who are, will sacrifice their lives and, and, and suffer all the hurts and tribulations of being politicians to serve others. And we pray that you'll give that integrity and wisdom to those people, especially President Joe Biden in the United States, as we see that situation going on there. We pray that in our election that 
people might, we might get some really great people to lead our country and that they'll stay being great and they'll stay humble. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. And finally, we pray for a great outworking of the Holy Spirit, of God the Holy Spirit here in these British Isles. We pray that as we are learning about being disciples and making disciples, that this, this fire might burn in our hearts and minds, that we might reach out, that we might show the gospel in our lives and our words to our neighbours and families and friends. But we pray that there might be an upwelling of faith, of joy, of hope in the British Isles, and that might be from the God, the Holy Spirit, working here. So we pray, Sovereign Lord, Heavenly Father, yes and again, may we see revival here again in these lands, in our lifetime, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And so let us gather all our thoughts and prayers together in the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever Amen. So let's stand to continue in our worship as we join in, and as I help you a bit better now, Jeff. <laughs> okay, there's the step.
And so, Father, we thank you for your holiness. And we thank you above all for Jesus. That means that we can encounter you. And that means that he makes us holy. Thank you for your Holy Spirit here with us. May he continue to open our eyes and open our ears that we might hear your words of life and that we might live this day in your name. Amen. Do grab a seat as we have our reading now this morning. This reading is John chapter 4, verse 21 to 24. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. It's good to be here with you this morning. And a wonderful thanks to the Lynch family um, who are over in Birmingham. They're one of our many mission partners. Um, if you'd like to find out about our mission partners, Gary Parks, who heads up the mission committee, has prepared a pamphlet at the back, and it tells you where, acro- where? across the world that where are influencing and sharing and supporting the gospel. So please do check that out after, um, or come and speak to us if you'd like to find out a bit more. If you've been with us recently, you'll know that we're working our way through a series called Disciples Making Disciples. And we've thought on such um, things as telling your story, reading and reflecting and praying, finding rest, thinking about our gifts. And today we're thinking about worship. That we as Christians, we as followers of Jesus, we as this community here in Christchurch are called to worship Christ. We're called to glorify him. And we want to do that as individuals, we want to do that as a community, we want to do that as our everyday, and to lift up our praises to God and what he has done for us. Now you all know that saying, you are what you eat. Now it's not a literal saying, if you eat apples you don't turn into an apple, or if you eat cake you don't become cake, though I've tried as I might to eat as much cake. You'll be proud of me, guys, I'll tell you a lot about cake, Wednesday night, life group, chocolate cakes produced. Think Bruce Bogtrotter, big chocolate cake. I said no. (laughs) I did take it home for Thursday snack though. (laughs) But that sentence, you are what you eat. If we eat healthily, we become healthier. Our bodies, we have more energy. We sleep better. We feel better. But if we eat unhealthy, our bodies become more unhealthy. We get tired. We're more lethargic. Our mood isn't as good. We don't sleep as well. But what if I also told you you are what you worship? And let me expand that a little bit. And you say, well, you are what you love. We worship what we love, and therefore you are what you worship. We are, as human beings, made for worship. We all worship someone or something or multiple things. They take up our, our headspace, take up our time, whether they're organized religion or not. And I remember seeing a banner at a football match and it said, Manchester United is my religion. That person has chosen to worship Manchester United Football Club. And it's not saying that in the, if you are what you worship, that in worshiping and following Manchester United, he's not going to turn into Old Trafford. He's not going to turn into a pair of football boots, though he may want to. But their love of that team has shaped who they are, has shaped what they do with their time, where they spend their money, what takes up the space in their heart, what podcasts they listen to, the conversations that they have. And it stands to reason, therefore, you are what you worship. So this morning, you probably know what question is coming next. What do you worship? Or what do you love? And how is it shaping you? 
How is it taking up your head space? How is it taking up your time? How often are you talking about it, thinking about it, living through it? One for pondering, maybe not an answer that comes straight to mind. Well, handily in our passage this morning, Jesus gives us a short lesson in worship and answers the questions of where, who, and how do we worship? And that's what we're going to take some time looking at this morning from our passage in John 4. But before we dive in, it's worth understanding the context of John chapter 4 and Jesus, who Jesus was talking to in this passage. John 4 is titled The Samaritan Woman, or more commonly known as The Woman at the Well. And Jesus, you'll know this passage, Jesus meets this woman. He's out in the middle of the day at Jacob's well looking, and this woman arrives, and she's trying to hide from other people, hence why she's gone out in the middle of the day. And she's going to seek some water from this well. And Jesus asks her for a drink, which is a massive no-no, as uh, highly controversial as she's Samaritan and he's Jewish, and they didn't really speak, to, be, to put it bluntly. And Jesus reveals to her that he is the source of living water, water that will, not quen- or will, that will fully quench our thirst. And we discover through Jesus' knowledge of her that she's been married five times and she's now with a man who is not her husband. And starting to understand a little bit of who he is and seeing that there's something different about this man, she tries to change the subject a little but decides to probe in a little. And we pick it up in verse 19. She says, Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She knew there was something about Jesus, and she wanted to ascertain what, to probe a little deeper, to, to question him maybe on some worship. As this was one of the great sources of division between the Jews and the Samaritans. As such, we get to our first question, where do we worship? The Samaritans only believed and followed the first five books of the Bible, and therefore they followed that they worshipped on Mount Gerizim, where Abraham had gone, and Jacob had gone, and that is where they had worshipped their ancestors, their forefathers. The Jews, on the other hand, followed more closely the journey of the Israelites, after the wilderness and through exile and all their trials and leading them through to Jerusalem. And that was where the temple was and therefore them, that they thought that was the only true place of worship. And Jesus responds in verse 21, woman, a bit sassy, I thought that was the start of our passage, woman. But he's about to drop some truth with her. He says, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jesus has not only broken up what the Samaritans believe, you don't need to be on the mountain top to worship God, but also to the Jews, you don't need to be in the temple to worship God either. You don't need to be in Jerusalem. Jerusalem itself would be destroyed in 40 years' time by the Romans. But more than that, he's saying God is not just present in one temple made by human hands. And he isn't just present on one mountain top. He is God, he is omnipresent and can be worshipped anywhere and everywhere. He's on every single mountaintop, he's on every single valley low. He's in every church, he's in every place that we can go. This wasn't just an issue for those Jews and Samaritans. This debate rages on for almost all generations. True and proper worship only happens in the church. And there are many of you might have heard that said before. This is not true. We can worship God anywhere, and we should worship God everywhere. Whether that's in our work, whether that's in our gyms, whether that's in school, in our shops, inside, outside, with friends, on our own, we are called to worship, worshiping God wherever we go. I know there are people who who struggle with this. I led an alpha course a couple of years ago, and a guy, um, he'd been in prison, and the only place that he could find peace, the only place that he could find Hope, the only place that he felt he could find God was going to that chapel. And therefore, whenever he came out, it was a real struggle for him to worship anywhere but in church, to pray in church, to meet God in church. And he knew it was true. He knew that, that he could meet God anywhere, but it, he had become so fixated on a place that it had taken up his time. And slowly but surely, he worked his way through this, and he started to worship God anywhere and everywhere, and it released him to worship God fully. They gave his life fully more to him. 
Jesus is saying we can worship anywhere. It's not just for 1030 on a Sunday morning. It's not for specific places at specific times. But there's a big but. And this doesn't mean that you get up and leave. Please don't leave. Please do stay for the end of the service at least. Um, How many times have we heard people say, I don't go to church, but I am a Christian. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. The question is, why would you not want to go to church? Why would you not want to be part of a community of people of all ages and stages? People, we have people in this church who are just born up over to, to nearly over 100 in this church congregation. And we worship together. We share life together. We share stories together. We glorify God together. Why would we not want to be a part of that? Why would we not want to come together and be fed spiritually? To have God speak to us. To start our weeks like this, celebrating God and seeing his work and his goodness. So why not do both? Gather with family and friends to worship God, but also find ways to worship wherever we are, whatever time, day or night, to bring worship to God. So that was where we worship. But what about who we worship? Jesus continues by telling the Samaritan woman in verse 2, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. With the Samaritans only acknowledging the first five books of the Bible, they've missed out on a lot of scripture, a lot of knowledge about God. And in particular, they've missed out on understanding and hearing about the prophecies of Jesus about his his arrival into this world. And it's to this that Jesus is speaking to. The means of salvation will come from the Jewish religion. And that means of of salvation is through Jesus. Jesus is being fully blunt here, zero ambiguity. There is only one Messiah, and that is him, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who went to the cross for each one of us, who took our sins and bore them for us. He is the only way to eternity, the only way for salvation from the Jews. And Jesus tells us this again and again throughout scriptures, throughout the gospels. And in John, he has so many of these I am statements. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's only through Jesus. I grew up on little Christian choruses. It's a, it's a very Northern Irish thing, and I know some of you have done them here as well, but they're often so simple, and they convey the truth about Jesus. And one that I remember, and it's been bouncing around in my head all week as I prepared this. You might know it. It says, one way God said to get to heaven, Jesus is the only way. No other way, no other way, no other way to go. One way God said to get to heaven, Jesus is the only way way. Jesus is the only way to heaven, and that is who we worship and why we worship him, for his love has redeemed all humanity and paved the way for eternity. He deserves nothing less than our worship. He deserves nothing less than us choosing to glorify him anywhere and everywhere that we can, giving ourselves over to him and glorifying him. He needs to be the object of our worship. That question We are what we worship. He needs to be what we worship. Not a football team. Not someone else. Not a relationship. But Jesus needs to be what we worship. So we've covered where and who. And lastly from our passage is how do we worship. And Jesus says in verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus gives us that simple instruction to worship in spirit and in truth. And it sounds fantastic, in spirit and in truth, but, but what does that fully mean? It's, it's, not, or it's not quite clear what that means. Well, how we worship is a constant bone of contention, isn't it? And it's caused many debates over the years inside churches, inside denominations, across denominations. How do we worship? True and proper worship is with the Book of Common Prayer. We must do our liturgy. We should only have the organs playing. That is the only true way to worship. We should worship with our hands in the air. 
Our worship should be spontaneous. I think we've all heard these debates and many, many more. You've maybe even partaken in them as well. Or we've maybe got caught up in thinking that just worship is just singing. Singing is massively important. Jesus doesn't say anything about the form of worship, what songs we sing, whether we do common worship or have the band playing. But rather, he's referring to our hearts in spirit and in truth. He wants us to worship in truth with sincerity that we are being true to ourselves and true to him true with our worship, and then that our spirit is behind it fully. Our very souls, our very core, the very heart of who we are is choosing to worship, choosing to glorify God, not just paying lip service or saying things glibly as though they might appease God. But God knows our hearts, so why not bring him all of your hearts? Give him the best of us and not the rest of us. And that question, you are what you worship. Will it be God? Will it be Jesus that we put up there in our worship? That we choose to glorify, that we choose to lift high? Now, for me, I do love sung worship. It is really important to me, for often singing can convey emotion. It can take you to a place that you maybe couldn't articulate yourself. The greatest thing it does for me is it takes me from looking here and looking up here. That I look to Christ. That I stop looking upon me, but I look at him. That I choose to worship him and not focus on me. That's why you might have, you might have noticed that we've changed some of our patterns of worship in the past kind of six months or so. And we've thought a bit about that and and that thing, you know, the beginning of our service, being upbeat and bringing us into the presence of God, having the kids dance around and sing and glorify God, that we go from whatever's kind of, whatever we're facing, the good, the bad, the indifferent, that we come in and we look up. That we come in and we look to Christ and the joy he brings, the hope he brings. Placing Christ above everything else. Not ignoring what's going on here, but placing him above it. And his authority above it. And that is why we worship. That is how we worship. By placing Christ above everything we do. And I am also a big fan whenever we sing that we go loud. That we lift our voices. And I also say the same whenever I do liturgy. Whenever we do the liturgy, let's not just mumble it. Let's lot. These are declarations about Christ, declarations about God, declarations about what we believe. Can we do it with some gusto? One of my best friends, a guy called Bob, he doesn't have a note. He can't sing for toffee. And I love standing beside him in worship um, because it's a real surprise whenever he does hit a note and it's, it kind of takes you, takes you back. <laughs> and you're, he doesn't care that he can't sing. And I don't care that he can't sing because he loves Jesus. And he's putting Jesus above everything else, what other people think, whatever's going on in his life. And I would love us to do that today. What we're going to do as we finish, we're going to invite the band. And can I invite you all to stand? And we're going to sing it's a sung worship. This is not, you have, might have other ways that you worship, but this is our opportunity to respond this morning. This is how we might glorify God this morning as we finish our service. That's by lifting God up, lifting him above everything else. That is how we worship. That is who we worship. And then it might send us out into our week that we worship him anywhere and everywhere that we can. So you might just want to bow your heads for a moment as we just allow some space. You might want to close your eyes. You might want to hold out your hands.
Lord Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for who he is, for what he has done, how he has loved us, how he gave his life for us. And Lord God, we pray that this morning that he might be the object of our worship. That it might be Christ that we put above everything, above everyone else. We put Christ, we lift all that's going on, the good, the bad, the indifferent, and we lift it to Christ this morning. And we proclaim who he is and what he is worth in our lives. Lord God, will you send your Holy Spirit that we might be filled up. might be filled up and inspired to glorify you, to worship you here and now and everywhere that we go. In Jesus' name, amen.
one of the things that's promised is that we have eternal life and that we get to see Jesus face to face and our crowns are thrown down before him where we worship him and are fully restored where there is no more mourning or crying or pain where the old has gone and the new has come and as we worship him in this life we too are transformed and know his comfort as we await that true hope. And so that's what we're going to sing of now. The true hope of Jesus, his lordship in our lives, his lordship of this week, and his lordship over all of creation.
Oh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you for your knowledge and love of us. And we thank you that you are ruling, but you don't leave us on our own. That your Holy Spirit is with us and goes with us into this week. And so as we step out into this week, may we know your blessing. The blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you, remain with you, and flow from you now and always. Amen. Just to remind us, some of the prayer team are there at the back, and teas and coffees are there. And some of the guys didn't manage to get uh, chocolate bars for Father's Day last week. So if you didn't get one, I'm going to put some more at the back for you. Do help yourselves as well. <laughs>